It's a challenging conversation when team members coming to you asking to be paid more. You feel frustrated, unappreciated, and sometimes downright angry. Tune into this week's episode where we unpack the mindset shifts you need to make to have a productive conversation and create a great team. You know, we get asked a lot how much you should actually pay tradespeople. It's actually more costly to hire the bottom 25%. The point is that you don't pay for your tradesperson. It pays for your tradesperson. That's going to be the biggest disappointment, much more than the exact dollar figure that they get paid. Do I have to pay them that much? No one is worth that much. No one's worth that much. Is there ever going to be a point where I don't have to pay him more? And I asked him, is there ever going to be a point where you want him to But money is only part of the equation here. And if you keep losing people because they're like, well, I can get $2 somewhere else or a dollar somewhere else, you've got another problem. Alrighty, welcome to the podcast. You've arrived at the Profitable Trading Podcast here with your host, Tony Fraser-Jones. Coming in strong today, Phil Smith, you're smiling. What are you laughing about, buddy? I'm laughing about the fact that you're coming in hot, mate. You're bringing some energy, some, uh, yeah, mate, some I'm real excited. zest. This is a thorny issue today we're talking about. What is it? Let's get into <laughs> it. Mate, we're talking about tradespeople uh, and basically them wanting more money. Uh, I'm sure we've all How been... How dare they? How dare they? Those... those criminals or scallywags uh we've basically all been hit with it right as uh you know i can get an extra another four dollars per hour uh, if i go to this other place down the road um i know another guy who gets paid x amount you know i saw an ad on you know trade me seat gum tree whatever indeed you know for five dollars an hour more than what i'm getting or what my mate's getting uh and so they're coming to you wanting more with their hand out uh and honestly you can feel really really bad about that you can feel blackmailed you can feel held over a barrel um, it's not a nice feeling, and so we want to dig into this today. Yeah, well, you, you're kind of uncertain about what you can afford and what you even want to pay as well. Uh, that's all part of it, and um, let's be honest, I think we've all done this. We kind of take the moral high ground, and we kind of feel like telling them to get stuffed sometimes. It's like, well, how dare they? Oh, I've given them a job. Uh, how ungrateful are they? You know, all that sort of stuff. You know, we get asked a lot how much you should actually pay tradespeople. question really is... Uh, or do I have to pay them that much? That's often the question. That just seems crazy. Uh, and so I think we want to dig into this today to understand some of the, the thinking behind it, what sort of strategy to take, because there's no perfect answer to this. Obviously, there's no, well, you should just pay them this, because uh, it kind of depends, right? Well, there isn't a number. I mean, if the no. number was, you know, $40 an hour, well, then someone else is going to offer 41 and then that's all out the window. So, <laughs> I mean, we really need to get into the thinking behind it to actually have a chance here. Yeah. And I'm sure you got a story for us. I do have a story, actually. One of my sons is uh, in a competition called Lit, Lit Quiz, Literature Quiz, and they have to study all the old um, stories and stuff. And anyway, uh, we were talking about Oliver Twist, uh, which is a cool old story. And uh, I was reminded how Oliver goes up to, uh, I think it's Fagin, and uh, you know, in a very timid voice, he says, Can I have some more? Oh, please, sir. Can I have some more? Tony actually speaks like that normally as well, so... Uh, no, yeah. that's you, mate. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Fagan is like, more? You want more? Like, he's just outraged. And uh, I think often as a uh, business owner, you feel a bit like Fagan. You want more? Like, what do you mean you want more? You're flipping ungrateful. Uh, there's a bit more to... to it definitely strikes that, a nerve, yeah. It yeah. does, and, and it can uh, it can make you feel pretty darn frustrated. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, more. Yeah, it's definitely a nerve to touch. And I think the thing is, is if we're not got the right mindset here, the right thinking behind this whole situation we can really run into some yeah, problems look, and we can create some we can create massive problems if we have that kind of high horse mentality and and stuff them mentality uh you will end up losing key team members you know because they'll get frustrated and maybe they can earn more somewhere else and you just miss the mark and if you're too pig-headed about it that's a problem uh and team morale takes a hit you know if you're not paying enough or people start moving you know if you lose one you can lose two or three and we've seen that happen yeah, uh, which is just gutting. And, uh, you know, everyone wants more. So, you know, if you pay people too much or you've got to get it wrong, it sets the expectations for everyone else. Uh, well, then everyone leaves the greener pastures. It's it's like a bit of a cycle. Uh, and, you know, it can hit your bottom line if you're not doing it properly and not understanding the strategy behind it because it's more than just obviously what you pay people. It's how much you earn out of it as well is a big part of it. And I'm going to be honest, as a leader, as a business owner, and I'm sure... Uh, we've all felt like this, I know I have, uh, particularly early on in business when I didn't really understand this, is you feel unappreciated and you can feel really taken for granted. It's like, hey, after all I've done for you, all you can say is, can I have some more money? Uh, and it's like, far out, man, don't you realise the you know, the effort I've gone to and, and all the, you know, how tough my life is as a business owner. Like that's you know We all see things through our own perspective. We're like, man, I'm doing it tough and this is stressful. You know how stressful this is? This is another stress you're adding to my life. 
And at the end of the day, we can make decisions as business owners without really understanding the financial implications. We're just yeah. like, ah, you're not getting any more. And we really need to dig down. Uh, and um, that that's important to understand how the, the big picture with it. Yeah, and I think like you know, building on one of your points, like uh, obviously you said team morale can take a hit, you know, and, and everyone can feel a little bit a bit bummed out about that, uh, and you can start losing team members. And sometimes it's not just that you might not be paying enough. Maybe you are, and maybe you don't even have to put anyone's pay up, but the way you deal with that conversation is mm-hmm. crucial because if the team sees you as someone who's not willing to even entertain it or or you know you shut people down and make them feel stupid for asking, then you know that can be just as bad. And so it's not just whether you pay them more, it's how you deal with the whole thing, which is really going to make a difference. It's important to bear in mind in pay discussions and employment discussions, there's always the power thing going on. You know, and and uh, you might feel like the employees have all the power, and maybe over the last few years they have had a lot of power. But it's sort of s- shifting a bit now with the, in- the economy changing. But it's often difficult for people to have a pay discussion with you because uh, you could tell them no, they might feel rejected and all that sort of stuff. So it's a it's an emotionally kind of charged environment, and so those situations they need to be done the right way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know if we're handling the situations the right way and our mindset's in the right spot, you know, we actually have a lot of opportunities. Yeah, to this make. is this is a way to really make some some gains and build a, a great culture. You know, you will retain your key people. You'll build a good morale, a good culture if you do this proactively and and thoughtfully and strategically. Uh, it'll show great leadership uh, as well. Uh, you'll have the right financial information. You know, when you really understand the big picture to make good decisions around this, and uh, you'll actually attract other people. You know, if you, if you do this well, word gets around. Uh, not only that you're paying well, but you're actually a good person to work with. That's really important. Don't underestimate that. Like the culture and the whole vibe is a big part of it. It's not just money, uh, contrary to popular opinion, which is wrong in this case. Uh, and, uh, you know, a great team is actually what's required to allow you to grow a great business. And so this this part of it is is huge. Yeah, it's massive. And I think at this point, let's dig into actually how to do it because some juicy stuff in here. Yeah, I think the first thing, if you go back to the story of Oliver Twist, I don't blame people for wanting the best that they can get. Like, it's natural. You want the best you can get. And if you think about when you were working uh, for someone else, did you want to be paid more? Yeah, I mean, of course you did. That's obvious. Everyone wants to be paid more. You know, people just want to get the best they can. And, and you know, you and I have had this discussion as well. It's like, well, when will this end? When, when will they stop asking for more? Never. Absolutely It not. never ends. No. This is this is the nature of being in business. The You know, people are always going to want to be paid more. And, you know, honestly, to have a happy life in business, it's important you get comfortable with that because it's just part of the territory of being a leader and, a, and an owner of a business. It's, it's always going to be there. So I, I sort of switched it on its head. You know, would you prefer to have someone working for you who never asks for anything, they're probably a little bit a little bit weak and a little bit of a wallflower. Maybe they're not the best employee either. And if they never ask, what will probably happen is they'll get to a breaking point where they're, you know, it's like in a relationship if someone puts up with stuff forever, eventually they reach a breaking point. And when they reach that breaking point, it's over. There's no recovery because there's so many years of resentment and frustration. You just can't, you can't pull that back. Yep. And so you, you, you probably, it's good to know if people are frustrated about that. So I think that's the first thing. Don't blame people for wanting the best that they can get. Everyone wants to get ahead. That's normal. So do you. And that's probably to be encouraged and and, um, and you got to just take it with open arms. It's part of the deal. Yeah. Well, it's funny actually on that point, uh, speaking to a client just recently on a call and uh, he actually asked me, he said, hey, is there ever a point when, you know, I can stop you know, expecting to pay somebody more and more. Like I've got this one tradesman who's, you know, he's on a really good wicket. He makes good money, pay him really well. Is there ever going to be a point where I don't have to pay him more? And I asked him, is there ever going to be a point where you want him to stop developing his skills? And he said, well, no. And I said, so you want him to get better and better? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, every day. Yeah, forever. Yeah. And I'm like, but you don't want to pay him more. And he was, he sort of paused and went, ah, okay, I get it. <laughs> You're an insightful uh, man. Thanks, man. But I think the key is, right, it's like we, we do actually expect that everybody comes to work every day and puts in more effort and improves and gets better and learns new skills. So, I mean, like hand in hand with that is regardless of all of the external factors going on or even their mindset from a purely skill remuneration level, um, there can't actually be an end to pay increases or pay increase expectations at least without uh, without there also being an end to the development of that person, which would be a shame. So I think I think... You've, you've got to look at it and embrace it like a positive thing anyway. 
you know, like you're paying for what you get. And I think like this is, a, again, brings me to the next point, which is you got to be really careful of the way you look at stuff, especially um, you can sometimes have this attitude of like, no one is worth that much. Oh, how often have we heard that? No one's worth that much. Right. Like, I mean, like, would you pay, you know, a tradesman half a million dollars a year to be on the tools? And, and I mean, there's always going to be a point where it's, it sounds sounds crazy, right? And I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying pay them half a million dollars. <laughs> but my point is, is, you know, you've got to be very wary of that mindset because firstly, if you say no one's worth that much, well, someone might be, you know, if they're really that good and they can really pull a result um, and they can really, you know, like actually balance whatever you're paying them into a return on that investment because it is an investment, then they are worth that much, in which case doesn't matter what you pay them as long as they're giving you a return on that. Um, and the next thing is just to understand there are external factors as well. Like, so whatever would be the top end of a range today, that might not be the top end of a range tomorrow because markets shift. You know, inflation happens. There's always going to be external factors that actually change the you know subjective and objective view of whether or not somebody is actually worth being paid more. Um, and so you've really got to let go of your ego here and not worry so much about whether or not you want to part with the money and worry a lot more about what that money is going to do and look at it like an investment to a person so that they can actually give you a return on that investment. Uh, because as long as there's a return on the investment, then they are worth that money. That, right? That's exactly right. And I think your point about the market shifting is a big one. And that's happened, you know, in the last four, five, six, seven years. And even with a lot of inflation recently is, uh, Often as a business owner or as an employer, we're thinking about the fact that uh, oh, we put an ad out two years ago and we were paying $36 an hour. Well, that's what it is. Well, it ain't. It's different. It's now 43 bucks. Yeah. Uh, just with inflation. Uh, exactly. and, and that's the thing. And so uh, I think that ego thing too is like, that's, that's massive. It's like, well, I mean, times change, eh? Like, my dad always tells a story where he says, oh, you know, I used to be able to go down the fish and chip shop and I could get unlimited chips and, you know, two sausages and a piece of fish all for 50 cents. And I'm like, yeah, but the future is now, old man. Like, come on, bro. Like, it's, that's yeah. not what it costs anymore. And, like, that's not a that's not an insulting thing to say. It's just, it's just the truth, right? I mean, like, very first job I ever had, I got paid $6 an hour. And, like, I mean, nowadays that would be, like, worse than, you know, slave labour in, in a lot of ways here in New Zealand. Like, our minimum wage is $23 an hour. So, I mean, when you look at it that way, it's, it's times change. It's yeah. just what it is. I think the thing with this is that um, there is no perfect answer, and, and I'd love to say there is, but I think there's a few things to think about. So, number one is it does depend on the area where you're in. Some areas are gonna you're going to have to pay more to attract people, and sometimes big metropolitans, you know, the, the wages are higher big cities that's that's fine uh obviously it depends on experience so the more experience you, you're going to be paid more uh good workers deserve great wages yeah so aim to be in the top 25 percent in your area and the reason that's important is because good people do deserve to be paid at the top simple as that and if you do pay them at the top or near the top it gives you some leverage so leverage is important because if you're paying well then uh you've got some sort of leverage your power in that relationship. So I think that's that's super important. No perfect answer, but definitely aim to be in the top 25% for me. Uh, and there are other parts to what will attract and hold people, which we'll dig into in the culture, uh, you know, the, the work environment, all of that is a big part of it. But if you're in the top 25% and you get the culture so side right, then that is that is really powerful. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's massive. And I think if we you know, if we build on from that as well, if we get in that top 25%, it actually doesn't matter what that top 25% is, provided we're getting the right margin on what we paid. And so if we're looking into the maths of this, and bear with me here, just trust me, the maths is right, okay. Um, but if we look at what a tradesman is worth, well, for a lot of the trades that we work with, um, a tradesman out you know, on the tools is probably going to pull in somewhere from twenty to $30,000 worth of revenue per month just for having them. So if we call it 25, average it out, then that's $300,000 worth of revenue per year that they can pull in. And if your GP, your gross margin, is 40% on your jobs, then that's $120,000 worth of gross profit. Now, sure, there's overheads to come out of that, but if this is a tradesman you never had before, and you know, adding them hasn't meant having to get other infrastructure like extra management and all that kind of stuff, then honestly, there's not much extra to come out of that than you would have paid anyway. So, you know, short of a uniform and uh, you know some depreciation on a van and things like that, then that $120,000 is $120,000 worth of profit that's extra that goes straight to your back pocket. So if you think about this, like for every tradesman you bring on, as long as they're doing enough work to keep them busy and your margin is strong, 
you're going to be making like 120 grand per tradesman in extra profit. Profit. And so when you think about that, it really just helps you to justify. And where this goes wrong is if I pay them more, that only is a problem if I take that out of my margin. Whereas if I'm charging that into my margin, then obviously what's happening is I'm still maintaining that same 40%. Uh, and I'm still maintaining that profit off the back of it. So, I mean, I suppose that really leads to where this comes yeah, from. Yeah, well, the big thing there is you make this 120k in gross margin, and look, it might be more for some and a bit less, but it's a great ballpark to start with. Then if you have to pay an extra $3 an hour, you're like, oh, I can't do that. But if you just think about that, how much is $3 an hour? It's about $6,240 exactly because I worked it out. Yeah. You know, over 2,080 hours a year, 40 hours mm. a week. Yeah, ballpark. So you get 120, but you're having to pay out an extra six grand. Yeah, like that. That's like printing money. If I could run that equation, I'd be just trying to hire more people to like didn't have enough work, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you pay six, you get 120. I mean, <laughs> maths is pretty it's good. A no right? brainer. But as you said, the point is that you don't pay for your tradesperson. Your no. client pays for your tradesperson. And so if wages are going up and material costs are going up, I mean, who has to pay for that? Well, eventually the client has to pay for that. And that's why your pricing strategy is so critical to hiring. Mm. And where so many people go wrong is they're like, well, I can't pay that. It's because they don't understand their, their margins and their pricing. And their pricing is off point or their productivity is not quite right or their organisation or their labour utilisation or something in that area is not working properly which is not enabling them to, to get their 40% GP or what, what, what their target is. And that's where you need to look. So you have financials and you're hiring. They're like, they go together like you know, hand in glove. Yeah. Your hiring strategy is all about your pricing and your, you know, your financial strategy as well. That's what really makes it work. Because there's, you know, there's three people who can pay for your employees' wages. There's them. You know, well, they're not going to want to take that. By taking a haircut. By taking they a haircut, do. they don't want to do. There's you. Well, that's not what business is Well, then you is take about. the haircut. You, you take don't the want to do that. Well, there's your clients, and they are the ones who should pay because they're the ones who are having the service provided. And furthermore, they are not taking a haircut. They are paying what it's worth to get the job done. I think if we flip this this mindset as well, because a lot of the time we say, yeah, but you know, clients won't want to pay that. It's going to cost extra to get the job done. I'm like, but if you need to pay more for you to get good tradesmen, then that's what good tradesmen cost. So as a resource in the job, and I just want to be clear, I'm not calling people resources, but I'm saying as a resource in the job, if, if that's what it costs to get the labor to do the work, then the work needs to reflect what it costs. Imagine if I said, hey, look, you know, PVC pipe's gone up by $2 a meter lately, um, but, you know, clients are not going to want to pay that because, you know, PVC pipe used to be $2 less per meter. So I'm just going to wear that because no one's going to want to pay for it. I'm like, that would be madness. Like, like if like putting that to somebody, they'll be like, no, that's not what it is. You know, you, you pay for what it costs, uh, plus a margin for your materials, right? Well, it's the same with your people. They need to pay for what it costs to have good people, plus a margin, um, or otherwise they're not going to get what they want. And if, if you look at the quality of the job, so people can pay for cheaper materials and they'll get a job which is not the same quality. Well, if people don't want to pay a higher price to get good tradesmen to come and do a job, well, then you could have cheaper tradesmen and charge them out for cheaper, but they're paying for a cheaper job. It's the same as buying cheap materials. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's madness. Like, you need to make a margin on the resources you put into the job, and people are no different. Yeah. Like I said, no perfect answer. Be in the top 25%. Do the math. Understand the finances underneath your pricing, margins, what a tradesperson is worth to actually bring into your business, and then make sure the client's paying for that, which is only fair. That's what it's all about. Absolutely. Final point on, on that part of it is, is when we were talking earlier, you were talking about no perfect answer. You want to pay in the top 25%. Well, the thing is, is those people in the top 25% are also the people that are more likely to do 30K worth of revenue per month instead of 20 or 25. Maybe 35. Maybe yeah. 35 because they're faster, they're more efficient, they get through more stuff at a higher level. You know, you can charge more for them, which also makes the revenue go up because they do a higher quality of work. They can do you know, more skilled work, that kind of stuff. And they maintain your margins better because there's no blowouts on time. You know, they're more efficient, they're getting through the work and, and, and there's no callbacks because they're good. So if you pay for those top 25%, they actually reward you with better revenue and profit on the jobs they go to as well. So, I mean, like, mm. actually, they're free. That top 25% of pay is actually free. It's actually more costly to hire the bottom 25% because you have higher instances of rework, callbacks, muck-ups, 
more dramas, more personal dramas with them, which leads to decreased productivity. You have less output and revenue as a result. Like, so actually, you you pay peanuts, you get the hypothetical monkey coming to work. You don't want that. Well, I have another point uh, to go after your point. Uh, We're obviously on a rampage on, here. On a rampage, yeah. but uh, you know, when you hire great people too, often they're people who have... Uh, really good skill sets which you can use to help train your other apprentices and other, other team members as well and that's that's really cool because now you're actually creating little uh, future workers as well off the excellent people that you've hired and so you get a double bang for your buck there and that's something that people uh, don't factor into this as well it's exponential oh, ROI I love this yes. exponential we that's love nice. exponential good ROI. bit of exponential ROI a little bit of compounding interest there we go <laughs> alright uh, which I think brings to the next point which is like front foot this stuff like the worst thing ever is when somebody has to come to you all the time asking, you know, for extra pay. You don't want them to feel like Oliver Twist. Like if you mm. put yourself in Oliver's shoes, like shit, he was hungry and he was trying his luck. Yeah. You know, like, and the thing is, is, you know, once or twice it's okay. But if every day you had to come back and beg for your supper, um, after a while you stop wanting to beg and you just feel really bad about it, which is actually usually going to lead to a lot of shame and anxiety and actually they probably leave before you ever have a chance and you, you often have those ones where someone leaves for a dollar an hour extra and then you think, I would have paid them an extra dollar an hour. Why didn't they just come to me? Yeah, I'd pay them too. Yeah, and the fact is, is they probably did come to you. They've probably done it many times. You probably didn't deal with it very well and so when it came down to that crux for this instance, they didn't come to you, they just left. And so I think you want to front foot this stuff. Like if you see somebody, you know, coming up with a better skill set, they've really improved or, you know, it's been a while since you've had a pay review or, you know, they're just really impressing you on site. You're hearing good things. You're getting good customer reviews. You're getting good reviews from their teammates, whatever. These are all signs that this person is performing really well. And, you know, they're indicators that you might want to front foot a pay discussion because if you front foot it, then you look like you value them. Whereas if they front foot it, then you look like you're placating them, and that's not the same thing. And if they front foot it, you haven't done your job as a leader, let's be honest. that, that I don't want to sugarcoat it. That's part of what we need to do to be a great leader. And if, at the very least, have a date in the calendar where once you do review the pay of your team, you know maybe it needs an uh, inflation adjustment or you have a look around or, or get an assessment from someone in the market to just help make sure you are on track because you definitely want to front foot this. Absolutely, and and but having said that, you know, like you you want to be in the top twenty five percent, but money is only part of the equation here. And if you keep losing people because they're like, well, I can get two dollars somewhere else or a dollar somewhere else, you've got another problem. You've got a big problem, and your problem is your culture. Uh, and you know, because money is, I can tell you one hundred percent is not the only motivator. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that are important, and it's the quality of the work environment. And there's several things here, you know. It might be, do they have some brightness of future? What's next for them? Uh, you know, do you actually show respect and teach them how to be a better human being? Uh, and there's uh, you know, things like, do they know what's expected of them at, on the job? Is it really clear? Is it well organised? Do they have the right materials and the right equipment to do, you know, to do a good job? Because, see, people love to win. They love to be productive. Uh, and we've talked about this before on the pod, but there's a, a lot of studies around happy you know, happy workers making productive workers, well, the relationship is actually the other way around. If you make them productive and they feel like they're winning, that makes them feel, you know, satisfied and happy. And that's what you want to do. Just giving them beers and barbecues doesn't necessarily make them happy because if it's a show and it's disorganised, then that's not going to work. Beers and barbecues are often a distraction from the unhappiness, actually. Well, they can be. I mean, they're good. They, they're good. Don't not do them. Just, yeah. But if that's all you do, that's, that's you're, you're missing the point. You're trying to divert their eyes, actually. Yeah. Like, do you give praise and recognition? So, you know, that's really important. Uh, do they know that you actually care about them as a human being? Is there someone they're actually developing, you know, taking interest in their development as a person as well? Um, you know, all that sort of stuff is, is really important. Do they have actually some, some friends at work? Like, you know, having a best friend at work is actually quite a powerful predictor of, of job satisfaction. It doesn't have to be your bestest buddy, but it means people you actually enjoy hanging out with and having a good time with because it is a social thing. Uh, have you actually talked to people about their progress? You know, like, are they doing a good job? Have you given them feedback? And, and spending some time with them, helping them grow and develop as a person is is really, really important. So all of that stuff, that cultural stuff, that leadership stuff is massive. And if you keep losing people just for a couple of bucks, it's giving you some feedback that maybe you've got some work to do in that area 
uh, which is hard work, but man, it's important work. Well, there's a question I once got asked uh, in a actually in a group discussion with some other coaches, and someone um, asked me, "Hey Phil, to what extent is working for you providing a better life for your employees?" And I think about that sometimes. You know, I think actually we do a really good job of that here at Profitable Trady, but I think for me that's quite a good north star question because it, it makes you take a real interest into you know the lives of your employees how things are going for them what you could do you know better to support them or help them or provide opportunity for growth it's not just growth within their business skill set or the, you know their work skill set their trade skill set it's it's you know personal growth too it's, it's helping your employees to you know live a better life because at the end of the day you know working is a vehicle it's a vehicle for you to live your fullest life possible and so if working for you is not helping them live a full life in one way or another, then that's going to be the biggest disappointment, much more than exact dollar figure that they get paid. Um, and if they're not finding fulfillment in any job, then they'll just continue to jump job to jump job to jump job for like 50 cents an hour, um, mainly because they're searching for fulfillment and not getting it. And so if you can provide that fulfillment, that's really the, the zest. Yeah, well, and, and they think that uh, the money will give them fulfillment. Look, it doesn't, but it's an important piece of the, the equation that, uh, that sets the framework for fulfillment to be able to happen because if they're not paid properly they can't you know get that fulfillment mm. uh, but it's not going to give them that so that's why you want to be in the top 25 percent then you do all this other stuff and what it does it, it makes you the employer of choice that's what it is great culture employer of choice people want to stay and they leave for really genuine reasons maybe they're moving town or state or whatever but not because they're unhappy Absolutely. Well, I think that's a good note to finish on. So should we land this plane? Today we've been talking about how much you should pay your tradesperson. It's a difficult question to answer and there is no exact answer. You want to be in the top 25%, but the key to success is to actually create an environment where people want to work, they want to stay, and you can become an employer of choice, which means people will stay forever and you'll attract great people to your business. Thanks heaps for listening. We'll catch you all again next time. Congratulations on being part of a select group of savvy business owners who are taking their businesses to the next level. And to help you on your journey, don't forget to check out our show notes for a copy of our free book, The Profitable Trady, and other valuable resources. Thanks for being a part of this special group, and we'll see you in the next episode of The Profitable Trady Podcast.